Welcome, Tom Hart. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for having me out. It's been a lot of fun so far. Um, I got to warn you, I don't talk nice, and I'm a little rusty. I haven't talked about this stuff in about a year. So every once in a while, a random curse word will come out. I'm just going to have to get over it. <laughs> um, okay. Lights. <laughs> Can you guys see that? Or is that light just on me? <laughs> okay, this is my dad. Okay? And my brother, when he saw this picture, said, if there was an entry in the dictionary or an encyclopedia that had squirrel hunter, this <laughs> would be mine. That's my dad. This is my mom. I don't have an expert. <laughs> and this is my mom and dad and me at Disneyland. Okay? And the reason I put this in is because I'm a product of my influences. I didn't have, most people say, God, this guy must have had a totally horrible childhood. No, no. I had a very supportive parents where I grew up was a very rural, backwoods town. We were the only liberal family in town. I didn't even know it until I went to college realize what we were. So my parents really supported me in what I wanted to do, which is make prints from the time I was really young. So, word around the Huck family campfire was that my dad, for my little brothers, my dad had some really cool magazines under his bed. Okay? And I was about 12, and my younger brothers nine and ten, and they were saying, the magazines, they're, they're called Playboys or something like that. And I was like, oh, you don't know me this as much as I do now. <laughs> so I'm going to go and look. And by the time I got under the bed, they were gone. But what I did find was a Newsweek publication called The Tower of London. And when you used to subscribe to Newsweek, you became part of a book club. This was Wonders of the World. And he had one of these under his bed. And I pulled it out and I opened it to just, I just, you know how you grab a book, you know, and you just open it without it starting at the front, open it up to the middle, and there was a set of engravings by George Cruikshank of Lady Jane Grey being executed. And this was it. This was the image that formed me. <laughs> I kept going back under the bed for this image and felt like I was getting away with something just as bad as looking at porn, you know, because I kept looking at this thing and I just could not get over this image and, and it really had a huge impact on me, obviously, I'm standing here um, talking about it, what is that, so 25 years later, okay, and the secret to all of my work is kind of in this image and it's you look at the executioner's eyes, they're crossed. In this harrowing scene, one little human gesture of comedy makes it, you know, whimsical. I use that word with friends today. And funny, and satirical. And that's pretty much it. So this is by George Crochet. Now, the second time I went back under to look under my dad's bed, I got pissed because there was nothing under there still and I went in between the mattresses, okay? And by this time I was like 13, and I found Robert Crumb. Now, <laughs> if you're 13 years old, and you're finding Robert Crumb, it's as good as Playboy, or better, for better or worse. Huge impact on me, you know? He was a satirist, and so I'm seeing all this stuff, and it's brewing in my subconscious, and I'm drawing like crazy around this time. I've been draw drawing since I was two years old. Okay, <laughs> all right, so in kindergarten, we had, we had this thing, you know, you have show and tell, but we also had this thing where they would draw something from home. And my, my dad's a chiropractor, and he had a real skeleton hanging in the house, and her name was Marilyn. And I draw something from home, and this is what I did. 
and and there, my teachers were like, oh my god. And I like it because I have the the you know the suture in the head, you know, from the growth together of the skull. I was had an eye for detail even then. I'm thinking about getting this tattooed actually on me. <laughs> Because I got skulls all over me. Okay, so I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, when I was 12, 13, my, my mom and dad took me to Washington, D.C. I went to the National Gallery of Art, and um, they gave me 20 bucks or so to buy any art book that I could buy. 20 bucks will not buy an art book at the National Gallery of Art, even in 1986, okay, or whatever it was, 85, 86. But it will buy a Dover republication of old prints. Those were cheaper. Those were available in museum bookshops, and they still are. And I just picked out this book called The Complete Woodcuts of Albrecht Durer. I didn't know what a woodcut was, but it didn't really matter. I thought they're just cool images. And see, I'm 13, 12, 13. I'm still into the same music I was when I was 12 or 13. I'm into Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and all that heavy metal stuff. And any image from that book could have been an album cover for Iron Maiden. That medieval stuff, you know, it really appeals to 13-year-old boys. There are knights and devils and Satan and the multiple-headed beasts and stuff. It's, just, it's really great for 13-year-old boys. And this had a huge impact on me. And, you know, it formed me. As a, as a graphic social commentator, ha having the sort of the power of the technique mixed with the democratic process, so I'm around 13 and I know I pretty much want to do images like this, but I di it didn't occur to me yet that they were prints. Okay, so I spend a lot of time on influences because as an artist you do not work in a vacuum and I'm a product of what came before me. Huge influence on me was Frank Zappa. When I was in college, I heard this album called Roxy and Elsewhere, and um, he was making fun of everybody. He was making fun of left wing, right wing, Democrat, Republican, men, women, children, dogs, independents, you name it. It was all fair game, and he's a good sort of lesson, equal opportunity offender. I'm against everybody, okay? I, you know, I tell people about my work. If you don't want to end up in my shit, don't do bad shit. It's a simple thing because I'll make a print about you and you'll end up in a museum forever. <laughs> forever. Even if it's deacquisitioned, it'll last in the provenance of the thing. Okay, so Pulp Fiction, the circular narrative, outrageous narrative, you know, highly visual, crazy, violent, funny violence had a huge impact on me when I was in graduate school trying to figure out what I wanted to say. Jose Guadalupe Posada, the me great Mexican printmaker. Um, I get really mad at my students when I say, does anybody know who Posada is? And they're like, no. And then I say, you're familiar with the Day of the Dead imagery, right? And they're like, oh yeah. I'm like, then you know who Posada is. You know, he, he basically did all that stuff. He was the National Enquirer of Mexico City. If there was a rape, a murder, revolution, he did a print about it that day and it came out, okay? No matter what it was, he would make prints about it. He did prints, you know, relief prints for matchbook covers, chap books, song books, cigar boxes, just cool, cool stuff. I'm very fortunate that I have been around in the right place at the right time and around some of the right people. Um, these are two images by a guy named Richard Mock, who was a hero of mine through high school. Uh, if, if any of you know the New York Times from about 1980 to 94, on the op-ed page, Richard's images were linoleum cuts that were on, the, on, on every week. So he was Posada for the New York Times, and very political. He was an anarchist. And I got to meet Richard when I was uh, 25 through another friend of mine, who you'll see in a second, Bill Fick, these great relief printmakers. And I got to go out to, t to Red Hook in Brooklyn and to his studio with my friend Bill, and I, I was just blown away. This guy, 
you know, he was living in squalor, drinking, you know, just strippers everywhere, making prints. Prints were stacked high, chain smoking. He had guns, everything. I was like, I want to be like that guy, <laughs> you know. And he was even better than what I imagined. And uh, he had a huge impact on me, and I have to give him uh, props. He died about mm, two or three years ago, and we wanted to do a show of us together. This is the guy who took me out there. This is a guy named Bill Fick, who started his own press uh, called Cockeyed Press, lived in New York. Now he lives in North Carolina. I saw his work coming through the mail. He would have giant mail lists of where he would send his prints out, real prints, and people would just tack them up on the wall of print shops. He was a hero of mine, so we had this dream to do this Fick, Huck, and Mock show. And John Buck. Buck, Fick, Huck, and Mock. Say that real <laughs> fast. It didn't happen, but one could dream. Okay, so after I met Richard, and after all my influence, and I limped through graduate school, um, I got out of school, and I had to move back in with my parents into their basement, and I decided, okay, my mom and dad were so scared. I had to move back, and I decided to do a body of work about my hometown, uh, where I'm from, because there's a whole history of, of narrative in prints, and I wanted to do something that was monumental in scope instead of scale. The graduate school that I came from was about working large, and I didn't have that option anymore because we didn't have, I didn't have a big press at that time. I do now, but I wanted to do a portfolio of prints that, that was about me, and that's what all my heroes did. Hogarth, Dewar, it was about themselves and how they fit into society and how, what their part in it was, either holding up a mirror and saying, look at how we suck, or, say, or just self-loathing and stuff like, oh, I suck, you know, too. So that's sort of what I was about at that time, and I wanted to make art about my immediate surroundings, which is my hometown of Potosi, Missouri. Population 2,600, 50,000 if you count the maximum security prison that's there. And it's a pretty horrible place. Um, well, the first, all these stories are true, by the way. They're true. Okay, I'm going to be asking, are those, are those true? You're full of shit. No, they're true. So the first one from the series, which was called Two Weeks in August, 14 Rule Absurdities, is this one. This is called Martha and the Grease Pig. And Martha and Mona Dobbs are the, were these sisters that lived at a place called Monkey Mountain Road. And they would come to town a couple times a year, one of times of which was the county fair, and they would enter the Grease Pig contest, competing against children, you know, well, teenagers or whatever, and they won it every freaking year. <laughs> and I figured it out. They had those dresses. They would come in full prom formal wear and combat boots, like dressed up. You know, everybody else was in like horrible clothes. They were dressed to go to the prom, you know, like a prom in the late 60s, really. And they had like the, ta was it taffeta? And it turns out that the taffeta was how they won because it grabbed the grease off the pig. That's what their secret was. And they win like a thousand bucks a night. And the adults wouldn't protest. They're whipping our kids' ass at this thing. You know, they'd let them win, you know. I saw this all growing up. The second one from the series is called Chili Dogs, Chicks, and Monster Trucks. I was in Europe uh, right after graduate school, and then I came home. I was in Europe for a couple of months, took a trip saw all the stuff I loved. And my friend Billy, there's always a Billy involved, isn't there, if you're in Missouri. Uh, Billy picked me up. Billy, Billy Joe is actually his name. <laughs> Billy Joe picked me up at the airport. My parents were out of town, and they knew I was coming home. And Billy Joe picked me up at the airport, and, I, and it's, Potosi's about an hour and a half south of the airport, or more, two hours. So on the way home, I was jet lagged, of course, and he was like, you know, Tommy, they call me Tommy there, you know, I got tickets to a monster truck rally tonight. And I was like, oh, man, really? And I knew I was going to do this set, you know, about two weeks in August, the whole thing, and I thought, well, I'll go. 
cool, let's go. And what it is, is that monster trucks, they pull these giant pieces of concrete, and then like when the winner is, is announced, you know, the Hooters girls are there, and they hand them a trophy, and then they do a victory lap, and then there are people running around in the pseudo sort of personality that's assigned to the truck. This night it was the grave digger, and people run around in grave digger outfits, you know, and then there are little fights that break out in the crowd. One's anti-Ford, the other's anti-Chevy, and there's skirmishes in the parking lot, beer everywhere, people drunk, and they're doing the victory lap. The Hooters girls are hanging out of the window in more ways than one, and I was just like, wow, you know, in the same period of 24 hours, I was at the Louvre, in Paris, and I was at a monster truck rally in Potosi, Missouri, and you know what? I liked both of them. It was, they were both had a huge impact on me. This is Catwalk. Here they come. Um, Potosi was founded by Moses Austin, who was Stephen Austin's father, who, Austin, Texas, so there's Potosi claims it. You know, well, it's true, but Potosi is a bigger deal than them than Texas. Okay, and Moses Austin's buried there, and so they decided to do a, when I moved back home, they did a Moses Austin Heritage Days Festival where they were going to have a fashion show and like museum sort of displays and everything through town, the town centennial. And the fashion show was going to be Victorian era, you know, clothing and everything, and they could not get anybody in town to volunteer to do the modeling except guess who? The, the Dobbs sisters. And so, like, I'm at this thing, and the thing about it is the Dobbs sisters were ready, and certain members of the crowd were ready, and then other people were like, I don't know how this is going to go down. Well, the Dobbs sisters, because there was a runway, they thought it was going to be like a strip tease. So they, like, come out, and they, like, start just immediately taking off their clothes, and, like, people were like, ah! Or these bunch of old men were like, yeah! <laughs> and, and what was funny is when Martha, Martha and Mona, Martha took off her top like, you know, James Brown is, right? Well, they, the, it's like the sheriff knew it was going to happen. He like whoosh, threw a blanket over and like ran her off the stage. We were like, boo, boo. And I'm standing there in the crowd. I'm like, this shit is easy. <laughs> so... Bed of bones. Um, Freddie and Helen Weasler uh, were a German couple that lived in a shack just outside of, in the Ozark foothills basically, just outside of Potosi. They came to town once a year. They spoke nothing but German. You couldn't get to their place. All you had to get to their place, had to get to their place on horseback. They would come to town one time a year and they would do two things. They would go to my dad's chiropractic office first. My dad was their doctor. Okay. And the second thing they would do is go to a local eatery. And every time they go into the restaurant in town, they would be asked to leave because they smelled so incredibly, horribly bad. And I smelled them. They were scary people. And man, it was like the kids in town were like, they're really zombies. You know, they're rotting from the inside. And you know how kids are. And, you know, they spoke a different language and everything. And it was a smell of death and rot, okay? And I remember one time I went up to my dad's office, and he, was, he had just treated one of them. And he, my dad was, like, bent over the sink, just like this, and having blue. He was blue from it. Well, one of them died. Freddie died. And... They had to medevac the body out. And what I remember is when they did this, they had to get up there on horseback and take sheriff's deputies and everything and fly a helicopter in to get the body out. But when they got up there, what everybody realized was how they had lived. Um, they had just let dogs and their pets just die in their house and kept them and kept all the feces, built like furniture out of the feces. And, let the dogs decay and rot under their bed. And, and when they medevaced Freddie out, they basically, he was like, he was attached to the, like a, his stretcher was way down here by a cord that was attached to the bottom of the helicopter because they didn't want him in the, in the 
chopper so everybody tells watching him fly off with this thing attached. It was weird. And I thought, I'm doing a print about this. And so while the way that I work is I'll work from my imagination. And I was coming up with sketches and preliminary drawings. I was thinking, man, I need a picture of a couple in bed. And I was in the grocery store. I knew I wanted to show it from the, this harrowing scene from above. And sometimes I will go and like find sources outside of my imagination if I really need to. And I was in the grocery store line. I was working on Chili Dogs, Chicks, and Monster Trucks, I think. And I was thinking, you know what? Man, how am I going to show this couple in bed? And, you know, I'm one of the people that look at the like Inquirer, chicken baby born in hen house to twin sisters, all that stuff. You know, I'm like, yeah, it could be real, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and so I've never done this before. And I'm going back and forth in my head. All the artists in here are like, yeah, you, you're always thinking. I was like, I gotta get this bed of bones. I'm ready to do it. Man, I gotta get this right. And people are taking forever. And then finally, I just grabbed like a TV guide, and I swear it was the Valentine's Day issue. And I opened it up, and there's a picture of Ross and Rachel from <laughs> from Friends in a bed from above. So it's really Ross and Rachel in there. <laughs> I kept her hairdo, Jennifer Aniston's hairdo, the same. Sometimes it feels like there's something else going on here where cosmic intervention or God or something. There they are, Ross and Rachel. This is the first print of mine that ever sold out. I don't know why people love this print. Uh, this is called Fried Eggs and Arson. Every, there's this family called the Sylvie family, and anytime they needed money, they would burn one of their businesses down in town. <laughs> and people knew it was coming. They, 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 but they had family in the insurance business. They had family on the fire department. They had family in the police department. And their family would just show up when something was burning down. And when I was in high school, they burned down an egg processing plant. And my town smelled like fried eggs for like a week. It was <laughs> awful. This is called Kohler City Revisited. My mom took me to this store called Kohler City when I was like six years old. And they were like a rummage store, kind of like a Salvation Army place. They had these great to used toys. If I could go back in time, I would so get some of the toys that they had. Because that was the 70s, so they had toys from the 50s now that are going for oodles of money. And, you know, they sold all kinds. It was a grocery store too, kind of, but what I remember is that they sold barrels full of used dentures. And I remember seeing this old I remember seeing this old man, I'm like six years old, take a pear from the pile and like try it on, and when it didn't fit, he stuck it back in the pile. <laughs> Sad but true. Sad but true. Okay, so this is what's hanging up here now, and it's very odd talking about this because I haven't seen that print for 10 years. I did this print a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I don't remember a lot about it other than what it was about. I don't really remember making it. Uh, this is, this is uh, part one of Snack Time Marcy. Um, it really, in hindsight, had an effect on what I recently did because it was a triptych, and it was in between the two weeks in August work and the bloody bucket, which we'll talk about in just a second. S Snack Time Marcy basically is about a fear of mine. I've always had a fear of dolls that have bodily functions. You know, like Betsy Wetsy and all that <laughs> stuff, man. You know, and I'm a researcher, you know, and, and like I'm an obsessive person. If someone like hands me a CD, by a band and I like it. I gotta have everything by that band, I gotta know everything about that band, and that's just the way it is. That's the way I was with print history. When I fell in love with prints, I had to know everything about it, everything about Albert Durer, period. Well, when I start a project, I do a lot of research, and so I looked into like dolls with bodily functions, and I found out that Fisher Price in the early 70s had a doll that wasn't only gonna go number one, but was gonna go number two, okay? And, and the number two was actually, was, uh, was Play-Doh, okay? <laughs> Stuff like Play-Doh. And, 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 it, and it came with a, a, 
uh, like a motorized, it had a motorized throat, and, and you could like feed it like these plastic French fries, and, and you had a, it had a Velcro butt, and you could pull the, the Velcro off the butt, and, and then like take the fries out. But like, <laughs> what happened was, when you fed it the fries, the reason it didn't make it to market was because when you fed it the fries, it had like a, a you touch the mouth and the motor would, it would set it off and the mouth would go like, like that. And then it would keep running until the French fry, which was that long, and then it would digest or whatever, and then the Play Doh would come out. Well, um, <laughs> the problem was that kids' hair stop at the scalp. So like these kids were getting in the test runs were getting their hair like ung, 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 and the doll would attach to their scalp and they would have to cut it off. So that's what it's really about. Yeah. I haven't talked about that in a long time. I think, okay, so in the, that's the first panel, which is the birthday party, which is revealing Marcy to the kids. And then the second panel, which I don't have reprodu even reproductive, this is the only one I have repro of. Um, the second one is Marcy's Revolt, and the, 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 they're attacking you know, the, the populace of the people that are boxing them up in the warehouse. And the third panel is called Burn and Kill, which is they're just killing them off because <laughs> you got to kill Marcy. Now, she, I had this idea, like a slogan for it. She eats, she shits, it's snack time Marcy, you know. <laughs> now... The joke, I'm always about gag jokes in more ways than one. You know, I want to make people, you know, when they see my stuff. You know, what always happens with the Play-Doh, with kids? They eat it. So this is a shit-eating grin. <laughs> so I'll get, I'll get to it here in a minute, what, what this, why. Why, t why, Tom? Why do you do this? So the Bloody Bucket was my next series. Um, the Bloody Bucket, you know, two weeks in August took three and a half years to do. The Snack Time Marcy triptych took a year to do. And the Bloody Bucket, which I'm going to talk about now, took about five and a half years to do. And I get involved in these long, drawn-out projects. You know, I've got my next 15 or 16 years planned right now. I can tell you pretty much what I'm going to be doing in about four years. Title subject, everything. And um, the good thing about doing woodcuts, they take a long time the way that I do them. It, it really gives my ideas time to mature. I don't knee-jerk reaction into anything. You know, by the time I get to a block, I know exactly what I'm going to do because I've spent six months prepping it while I'm carving something. Okay? I know. I leave no stone unturned. I approach it like a movie director would. You know, I, I do my research, lay it all out, do a lot of prep, drawing, and everything. The first one from the Bloody Bucket is called Dollar Dance. This one. Um, the Bloody Bucket was a bar that existed just outside of my hometown from 1948 to 1951. It was a really violent place, and I heard these crazy stories about it growing up. So I wanted to give those crazy stories imagery because they only existed in my head. you know. So it was really about pleasing myself. I do all this stuff to, to get it out of my head because if I don't get it out of my head, I'm going to, like, shoot up a McDonald's or something, you know. This keeps me from being in jail, okay. <laughs> Dollar Dance, I actually saw this. This is what the first one of the series was. I, I figured, well, I'm seeing this now, and I bet it happened at that bar. I went into a wedding reception, and I, for a friend of mine, my friend, it wasn't my friend's bride. It was a friend of the friend of a friend. And I went in, and the bride was pregnant dancing on a table for change, okay? Wow. wow is right. <laughs> I thought, I bet that happened at the Bloody Bucket. This is sort of the whole, almost the whole series was built around this image. This is called Death of a Sailor. And I heard this story growing up. That this guy killed a sailor that was returning home from service with a pair of gardening shears. You know, if you're going to kill somebody with something, that's not, I mean, it seems like, you know, it's a lot more work than it's worth. But 
highly visual. <laughs> and I heard this story growing up, and this guy was the guy that was the killer was a patient of my dad's. Yeah. You just there he is. In the middle of all of this, I got a, I started getting offers to do things that were um, um, you know, a little different than what I was used to getting asked to do, which wasn't much. <laughs> Being a person that does prints about, you know, killing people and dolls that poop and everything, you know. And uh, I got a phone call, actually, I got a post-it note while I was teaching at Wash U. During a drawing class, the secretary brought it to me. And it was just like, I think it was in 2002. Handed it to me and said, call MCA Records immediately. And I was like, with the number, I was like, oh my God, they got me for downloading music. <laughs> and so I ran down to the office and I deleted all my iTunes. I was like, delete, delete, delete. Oh, delete it all. God, no. And then I was like, Whoo. and I guess oh, I better call them, you know. <laughs> so I called them up and this lady was like, she was German. She was like, how soon can you be in LA? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> we will fly you here. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, there's a band that wants you to do something for them. They've seen your work. And I was like, that's horrible German. But I don't know what, it's not really, I don't know what that is. But I was like, who? Who? And there, she was like, the Roots. I was like, I don't know who that is. I really didn't know who it was. And I was like, okay. And then like the next day, I was on a flight to L.A. to meet the Roots. Okay? Like the next day limo and the first class. <laughs> it was bizarre. I didn't know who they were. And I actually ran back upstairs. And my, I was freaking out because all my music's gone. But <laughs> yeah, I went back into my drawing class. This is on a long break. <laughs> the class had a really long break. And I went back in and I decided to ask, like, has anyone in here ever heard of The Roots? And they were like, whoa, yeah. And I was like, hmm. You know, I don't listen to hip hop, but who knows who The Roots are? Y'all know who The Roots are. Well, this, it, you know, it was insane. I can't believe this thing. And uh, the, a little other side story, you'll realize I'm full of stories. Um, this thing went, came when I get asked about this once a week now. For about two or three years, I didn't even hear anything about it. And then I, I constantly, I get emails, did you really do that and all that stuff. And it's kind of something I really ended up being proud of. I didn't realize it. But somebody came to my show in, in San Francisco and was like, did you really do that Roots album? I was like, yeah. They're like, that's like iconic. And I was like, God, I like pooped that out in a day. <laughs> you know, because I didn't know who they were. You know, I was like, okay, I'll draw it. You know, I was just relieved to not be in trouble. And, and then one day we were at the studio. It was like 2005 and got this huge shipment in from LA and from, of the show. And we put my assistant, I told him, put it in the back. I knew what it was. It was like on a pallet of you know, crates and stuff, and we put it away. And then we needed one of the prints out of there about a year later. And he went in the back and he started unboxing. And he's like, uh, Huck? There's, he stopped. He's like, uh. I was like, what's wrong? Which one's damaged? And he came out and he was holding a gold record. <laughs> I got a gold record for this thing. The company that designed, helped put it together, it came in that same day with that shipment that I was just like, it was in a crate that looked like a bunch of other stuff. And I just was like, wow. And another little side story was that I was like, every month at Evil Prince, we can't pay the bills. We managed to somehow. And like the gas man will come by, came by once, and it's on the wall. And, and I was like, shit, I forgot to pay the gas bill. You know, and I'm, and they'll take, Lecle Gas will take a check, you know, on the day that they come to disconnect you. And he's looking around, I'm scrambling for a check, and he's looking, and he goes, Y'all can't pay your gas bill and you got a gold record? <laughs> Back to the bloody bucket. This is ultimate cockfighting. Where I'm from, they, they fight emu. And if you've ever seen it, if you've ever seen it, it's way different than cockfighting. It's like these long, and they're mean, and they bite. And humans can ride emu. They're really strong. There's a detail. 
the, the qual one qualification to usually be in any of my prints is you have to have bad or no dental work and you've got to be armed. <laughs> and, and your family tree usually has absolutely no branches whatsoever. <laughs> okay, this is the most heinous print of mine. It's called Anatomy of a Crack Shack. And I thought, well, with, with bar living, you know, there's always going to be sex involved, right? Because you're going out on a Saturday night and you're drinking, obviously one thing's going to lead to another. At least that's where I'm from. And it's usually in cars and alleys, wherever, on the parking lot. See, y'all know what I'm talking about. No one wants to admit it. And um, um, I'm honest, that's why. Um, and I, to, for effect, I call it with my students, it's called a visual leap. <laughs> Um, visual and narrative leap, I have to think, okay, where's the worst place two people could be doing it? Where I'm from, it's probably an outhouse. So I'm going to put them in an outhouse because it's a confined space, right? And so I drew this thing out, and he's a war veteran because all the guys that came back from the war were the ones that were hanging out at the bloody bucket and doing a lot of this bad stuff. They just sort of continued the violence back home. They were all veterans. And uh, I thought, well, he's got to have some, like, what do they call them? Prosthetics. And, you know, a peg leg because he's a pirate. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I drew it out. I draw these things out really small. And I also thought, well, the woman, she's got to have, she's not going to be. <laughs> this is great you know and my wife when she's frustrated with me makes this face like <sighs> like she has a really pointy lizardy like tongue you know I have a picture I should put it in my talk of that to prove this she was she's already pissed about this guys so and I decide well that's the expression <sighs> you know people in my prints are usually making like it's usually this like or or like you know, um, so when I'm doing these things, the research and everything, I'm drawing them out, and you know, I'll call my dad like if it's a medical question. I call my dad one day. They're used to this by now. Hey, dad, I'm drawing this out on the block in the studio, right? I'm like, hey, dad, where do they? How do they attach like prosthetic arms, the old kind, to the arm? He's like. At this point, there's not even a delay. It's like, they attach it directly below the blah, 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 and there's a strap that wraps around, blah, blah, blah. Okay, thanks, Dad. Click. And then, like, 20 minutes later, I'm like, yeah, they should be in an outhouse, you know. And so I called Dad, and I was like, hey, Dad, Dad, what's, this is 20 minutes later. What's the, on the outhouse? Is it a moon? And my dad at that point was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> And so when I draw these things out, you know, they're this big, and then when I blow them up, and there was an exposed area compositionally when you blow them, I redraw them big, you know, it's by hand, you know, and I, there was a weak area, like, between his legs. And I thought, man, there needs to be something in there. And, and I, I, see, here's, you know, the, with the doll and the shit-eating grin in a moment like this with the dog. I'm in my studio and I'm alone, okay? And my imagination runs wild, okay? And I sit there and I tell myself, Tom, don't put that dog penis in there. <laughs> don't do it, Huck. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then I do it and I feel good. I feel better. <laughs> because it's not in my head anymore. You know? I don't know if I have a close-up of it yet. Well, you know, I, you don't see the dog wee-wee here. And it, the reason I put that stuff in there is because that's something that all of us see. You see it in the park, and, there, and their dog is like humping another dog or whatever. And, you know, and you're always like, <laughs> how are those cardinals, you know? And no one really talks about it. It's the nature. It's so real. And I'm, I really, like, I go for full effect in these things, like the dimples in his butt. Stuff that you don't want to see, you know. This is called the Jolly Guano Brothers Ride Again, and it's about two brothers, the Jolly family, that's really their name. They robbed a bank with cow pelvises on their head as the masks, and they escaped on a Schwinn bicycle in tandem, 
and the and the and the cops showed up and like picked them off like pew, while they were pedaling away and and I thought it was bull <laughs> shit you know I thought this is bull you know but I heard the story for years and the I believe shows you how I am I believe the pedaling off part the what the the thing that didn't make the story believable were the cow pelvis masks and I and where I'm from people put like bones of animals in their yard gardens to decorate it, cow pelvis, so you can buy them at flea markets. And I ran into a cow pelvis at a flea market, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to try. And it turns out that if you put, I should have a picture of this too. Boy, I've got to redo this talk. Um, if you put your head through the birthing canal at the appropriate, like you put it on, it, there's an opening there for your mouth, and the eye holes are the hip joint sockets, and then there's this menacing like horn thing that comes off. Then if you flip it around, it looks even more devil-like, and it just extends out, and the angle of the eye socket holes are like more like more Asian, you know? So it's, and it works, it really does, so it's true. <laughs> this is called Possum Promenade. Um, there's this thing called the broom dance if you're Drunk at the end of the night at the bloody bucket. If you're, a, if you're alone, if you're a loser, drunk, alone, loser. At the end of the night, if you don't have a partner, they used to have like these those wispy little house on the prairie brooms with human features sewn on them, and you just do a broom dance, you know. And I saw it, the band in this is called Pete's Possum Promenaders, and you know Billy Joe. Remember Billy Joe? He was the kid in the, on the bike in Fried Eggs and Arson. He's the guy that took me to Chili Dogs, Chicks, and Monster Trucks. Well, his grandfather was Pete Booyer, who was the house band at the Bloody Bucket. And Pete used to come and do school um, assemblies at when I was in like third grade and would tell tall tales and play the fiddle, and he would do a broom dance. And I was just like, when I was third grade, I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a print about that someday. <laughs> Instead of coon skin hats, they have possum skin hats, and that's what this one's about. This is called Joe's Meat Grinder. In a way, the entire bloody bucket is, there's Death of a Sailor, and then this one sort of is, is the summary of it. This is about the duality of things from that time. Um, you know, the, Tom Brokaw wrote that book, The Greatest Generation. And, you know, it's real easy, no pun intended, to whitewash history and look at the best of it and leave the other challenging stuff out. You know, I grew up at a VFW hall. I was like 10 sitting at a bar with these old guys, okay, World War II veterans. And they... All of them, they fought in Japan, you know, they fought the Japanese, they, they liberated Europe, and they were the biggest bunch of racists and bigots that I could remember, I have ever seen, okay? So, you know, if you don't talk about that, and I decided, well, how am I going to do that? Because that's an important part of this, so I'm going to do a Klan rally slash Veterans Day parade. And I've always been freaked out about, remember the visual leap, kids, um, I've always been freaked out about the Macy's Day parade, and I'm always a fan of when the balloon gets away, the one that gets away, you know, is over in Brooklyn and wreaking havoc, you know. And so I decided to have these, like, racist stereotype balloons coming into town. And, you know, I was really nervous about doing this because I'm a fat white guy from southern Missouri, and I'm going to put these stereotypes on balloons. And th there's a lot of James Ensor in this, Death Pursuing the Human Herd, one of my favorite prints of all time. I rip off a lot of old prints because I'm a big fan of that stuff. All those guys ripped off each other. Um, uh, the Jolly Guano Brothers, there's Night, Death, and the Devil by Dewar. I totally lifted that you know, an idea for that print. Well, I was really nervous about it, and you know who the first person was? I get to tell the story now. The first person to buy this print, he loved it, was Roger Shimomura. You guys know who Roger is? 
And, and it's just like, he's like, I love this. I was like, oh, okay, if I have your blessing, he's like, that's fine. I understand it, man. I get it. <laughs> I was like, cool. I love his work. This is called Beef Brain Buffet. Okay, they eat beef brain where I'm from. And, of course, in mine, they're going to be eating it out of the skull of the cow. This is a family night out at dinner, you know. And I had a problem with the kid. Before the, the square dances, which was like possum promenade, they would serve beef brain, okay. It's just the tradition, you know, buffet style or whatever. And... I had a problem with the kid in the middle because I wanted this kid to kind of be like scared but happy at the same time and I knew he was going to have the juices on his face and stuff like that. And so I'm going through, I'm redrawing it, redrawing it. I couldn't get it right and finally I just happened to have a Time magazine and it's Elian Gonzalez. <laughs> he was at, at Disneyland freaked out by the Goofy. He was like going, hee hee, and it was perfect. Remember Elian Gonzalez? There it is, eating out of this cow skull. Now, that's the end of what I'm showing from the play bucket. From time to time, I get asked to do, like, uh, like the Roots thing, for illustration jobs and for T-shirts and things like that. This is, I did a series of T-shirts, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, updated. And this is war for a company called Me Against the World. And for a while there, there was a rumor that these things were going to be carried at Macy's. The jury's still out on that, man. And if I can get the four horsemen of the apocalypse to be carried at that place, game on, kids. <laughs> game on. Um, this is uh, the latest Landfall Press print that I've done. Um, it's called uh, Pork Chop Suey Oinktoberfest. And the whole idea here is I have a problem with cops. Authority in general, okay? And I'm one of these people that I have a great job, actually, because if somebody pisses me off, like I said earlier, I'm going to make a print about them. You've got to really piss me off, though. And I have a problem with parking cops the most. Like today I was worried they were going to tell me in visitor parking out here in front. I was ready to start a big scene, you know. You know, and I just, I can't, I just, the cops are never around when you really need them to be and always there when you don't, okay? And I just, I'm a re I have a real problem with authority. And so this is my way of, it's a, a pig roast, a cookout. I love the laughs on that one. <laughs> <laughs> More illustration stuff. Okay, if, if you notice, I have this gigantic like motorhead tattoo on my neck. They're my favorite band of all time. And it just so happens that now I'm getting to do some stuff for Motorhead. And December 1st, I can't believe what I'm saying this, I'm going on the road with Motorhead for five days through Germany. And I'm going to come home either in a box <laughs> or get a liver, go straight and get a liver transplant. I'm, my wife is so scared because I, I usually they'll come to St. Louis and I'm all taken care of because I know some of those guys now. I've done some posters for them and now they like come on over to Germany. You know, so I'm going to go to Germany on December 1st and tour on the bus with Motorhead for a while. I do a couple posters for them. I cannot believe that is happening. Um, the Democratic Party in Missouri were really worried this last election, and I'm worried now <laughs> um, about the right wing and all that stuff. Um, you know, I, I kind of, I think the Democrats kind of suck too, you know. I'm pretty much that middle of the road, everybody's guilty, like Hogarth. But the Democrats asked me to do something to sort of help swing the vote a little bit. They were trying to do everything. And for some reason, they picked me and to do a bunch. And Peregrine Honig, this artist from Kansas City, to do these billboards that were all over Missouri. Because Missouri was a, was a war state in the last election. So they, I did this drawing. It was like this big, okay, of this like squid. The, the gas tentacles, America being the slave of big oil with the, on an empty, on an empty uh, tank, basically. And um, 
so I did this thing. It was like that big. <laughs> this was everywhere, and it was up forever. And it's just... I actually, that's my signature up there, and they did this big thing where they unrolled it, and it was like as big as this room, and they had this big photo op, and they gave me a marker like this big around. <laughs> and I was like... <laughs> this is my shop, Evil Prints. Um, this is the back part where we print. This is our print shop. And um, now... I, the, the prints that you see upstairs hanging were hand rubbed with a wooden spoon on my parents' kitchen table. Okay? Now I have a, a press that's big enough to um, publish my work. And, you know, my print shop is in um, downtown St. Louis, Midtown, and I'm very lucky. But I put everything back into the shop. You know, it barely survives. It's barely survived now for about 15 years. The print business is a very hard business to be in, but I absolutely love it. And I basically made a tree house for printmaking that I always wanted. And we have such crazy stuff going on there from day to day. Um, but Evil Prints is the name of my shop. And where that came from is when I was teaching at University of Missouri in Columbia, one of my students was helping me print. My, my block, one of my blocks, he was like, man, Tom, your prints are evil, man. And I thought, that's a good name, you know. So that's the shop. Now, evil prints is kind of like this umbrella that I sort of have created now where I can get away with stuff that I've always wanted to do um, because it's under the evil prints thing. And if it fails, I can blame it on somebody else because most people think we're a little bit of a bigger organization than what we really are. It's like really me, myself, and I with a bunch of exploited interns doing horrible stuff for me all day long for college credit. Okay. And one printer who doesn't get paid. So I am shameless in promoting... The reason I did this calendar of pinups, and the reason that I did it, and we'll get back to the prints here momentarily, I did this calendar of pinups for revenge because I never, none of the girls would pay attention to me in school. And everybody back from home now knows what I do now, and I get in the paper from time to time, and I mailed them all a calendar with all these girls that I never would have paid attention to me in school. Now they'll do it for evil prints for free, and we'll, we'll set it up and make it more me. You know, Russian constructivist propaganda pinup art, okay? With my images in the back, you know? That's Sam. And they were all local girls, too. That's the thing. They're all local girls who, I was so surprised. Can you imagine me, like, I'd be at the bar, and I saw a girl working out. I was like, would you like to be in a, cal a pinup counter? And they're like, if they didn't throw their beer at me, I'd usually have to have backup with me, like, no, he's serious. This is a real legit thing. Come up to Evil Prince and have pictures taken of you. It's really legit. <laughs> we did that, and they were all hand printed, so it's, it's like this promotion thing, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. Okay, so this is sort of where I'm at now. now this is like 48 by 92 inches, and it's my, I'm doing these, this series of triptychs. Uh, now it's called, the, it's a cycle of images, 15 4 foot by 8 foot triptychs. Uh, it's going to take, two, it took two and a half years to do this one, plus the two other images, which you'll see. It's called The Transformation of Brandy Baghead. And it's from the cycle of images that I'm calling Booger Stew. And the reason that I'm calling it Booger Stew is because, number one, it's a hodgepodge of everything now. I'm going in a broader based social commentary. It's hillbilly stories, political rants and raves, personal stories, my, turning the mirror on myself about, you know, my screwed up, you know, perversions and everything. You'll have to wait for the prints to come out for that one. Um, and, you know, I'm, it's a hodgepodge of everything. And the second reason is because now the work's going to museums and stuff, and I want to have some curator have to say, no offense to curators in here, in this voice, <laughs> His latest body of work, Booger Stew. <laughs> and the whole thing is, I, you know, I like the, the words that sound like they should, like puke, 
vomit, shit, spit, booger, phlegm. I love that stuff. You know. And I just had this show at the St. Louis Art Museum, and it's bizarre to see those placards. Booger Stew, his latest series, you know, and it's like really <laughs> put now in the context of all print history and stuff. This is a close-up. Okay, the transformation of Brandy Baghead. This is the center panel that you're seeing a detail from in the image before it. Is about a woman who's having herself turned into a chicken to enter a reality TV show ice skating contest. And it's all about that TV show, The Swan, a few years ago, where they took they had an ugly contest for women, like an American Idol audition, and then they picked the ugliest ones, and then they gave them all kinds of massive plastic surgery, and then put them in a beauty pageant at the end of it. It only lasted one year. Surprise, surprise. But I'm sitting there on the couch with my very pregnant wife. She's addicted to reality TV. I hate it, but I'm having to watch it because I got to be the dude in the, the the husband. You know, it's okay. And, and, and so, this is another one of those this is easy, you know, because there's always going to be some idiot out there doing so, something one of those, to give me easy. an idea, you know, to something to make fun of. Some idiot out there doing something to give so me an idea, the to, something to you know, make in fun of. center panel, she's being sewed up with cat gut and, and tape, the feathers are being taped on, you know, and this is the beak. There's a direct reference to a print in this by uh, Hans Bergmeier, Death Surprising Two Lovers, where the angel of death is like pulling the soul out of the throat of the male in the image. It's beautiful. Of the male in the image. It's a beautiful print. This is the entire triptych. It took two and a half years to do this. So in the first panel, she's the vegetable queen. The first panel is called Beta Carotene Queen. And it's, you know, the vegetable queen of a, a county fair, fall festival sort of thing. You know, if you eat your vegetables, you'll be just fine. That's what they tell you. But then she decides to get a lot of attention for herself and have herself turn into a chicken to enter a reality TV show ice skating contest. And then the third panel is her as the chicken woman skating. And she's in the reality TV show ice skating contest. And it's a, there's a gong show-esque sort of theme here. And that pose is totally Michelle Kwan. I took it off of her Wheaties box because I needed that, like, <laughs> thing, you know? And that's, I just totally took it and morphed her face into a chicken lady. And gave her, like, pox on her leg and everything. I can't bring these with me anywhere because they're so delicate. Because these are all cut out. It's shaped paper. So they're all objects now, and I'm moving in that direction with my stuff. So I get into um, I get into these projects. They take two and a half years to do. Now I do maybe two prints a year, and I keep my editions really low. I do an edition of 25 usually, and no more than that. And the reason for that is I believe that if someone's going to spend the amount of money that these things go for now, which is at the higher end of a contemporary print you know, that has an addition, uh, it should be a special thing. It should be a big deal when people get them. Well, what has happened is I'm a sucker for rock and roll, okay? I have been since I was little, and I'm a gigantic Kiss fan, okay? You're wondering where the hell this is going, aren't you? <laughs> so, okay. I... Why is it that when a new print comes out, it can't be treated like a new Rolling Stones record when it used to come out? It should be a big deal. So I have started promoting these things because there's one every two years or something. So what happened was, when I was little, I used to get, I got Kiss Alive too. And what would happen is, you'd open it up and you could join the Kiss Army and be a loser with everybody else, you know? And you get t-shirts with it, stickers, and you become part of this, this club, you know? This, would be on, this was on the inside of Alive 2, okay? And also on the inside of Alive 2 were temporary kiss tattoos. And it was a gatefold, you know, where you could open it up and see the upper 
right hand image and then it would come with a booklet inside it was about getting goodies it was a big experience which is a part of the problem with CDs now you know it's not the same and so I decided when, when Brandy Baghead came out for the first time we were gonna have a website presence with a special animated feature at the beginning of it it's still up there you can see it on evilprints.com and I'm doing my own merch we print it all in my shop, all Brandy Baghead based merch. T shirts, underwear, modeled by strippers from St. Louis, <laughs> burlesque performers, and we just do this whole thing up. And, and there'll be another. The one I'm working on now is called the Tommy Peepers. And uh, that's another triptych. And I'm going to do it again. I'm going to promote it in a way. And what has happened is, you know, I'm a believer that if Dewar or Posada were alive today, they would be printing their stuff on skateboards, on t-shirts. I don't care how high faluting people can put it in a frame now and claim that it was this, you know, those guys were about getting their imagery out at all costs. Now it's something you see in a museum, and it should be there because it's rare and it's old, but it's still cool enough image that it could be anywhere. And my prints, I believe, can also be at, in a museum in a frame but they can also be on a t-shirt it just doesn't matter to me I think it, it can be anywhere stickers and, and the like and I keep the shirts a limited edition too when they're gone they're gone I eat the cost on a lot of these things I just give them away usually you know I never really sell these things I just it's part of getting it out there and so the the latest thing that I'm working on now and I'll end after this one more last story uh, the thing that I'm working on now is called the Tommy Peepers. It's in the photograph. I'm carving it in the photograph of my big, huge head that's on all the cards that everybody's carrying around. That's what I'm carving right now. And it's me turning on myself, and it's all about my porn fascination, which goes way back to, un I was, hey, I couldn't find it, right, under my dad's bed. <laughs> I'm still on a search for it. Um... And it's all about the first time I saw breasts. I'm spending a year and a half, two years on this one moment that happened on June 15th, 1983, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon at the Potosi City Pool. Her name was Stephanie Harrelson. She was a senior in high school. I was in fourth grade. I was underwater in the shallow end. I had goggles on and a snorkel. She had to cool off. She dove in. When she hit the water, her top came down for a half second, and I was like, I don't need the Playboys anymore. <laughs> I just saw it in real life. And I am doing a whole year and a half, two years of reliving this every day. And it's really a problem. <laughs> it is becoming a problem. I am dying. I got to get this thing done. And so it's too much. It's too much seeing it every day, you know. And a couple of little things that went along with it, you know. I, this is how obsessive I am. There's a, um, you know, I'm about the research part of this. So this is something that I lived and I saw, so I had to research a little bit going back into my history. And I've become friends with a lot of people at the radio, the certain radio station in St. Louis that plays like metal and stuff because I've done posters for them and promotions. And there was this radio station called KHTR, which was the top 40 radio station in St. Louis, and it was playing on the jam box. <laughs> that day at the Potosi pool and I pretty much know what song was playing when she hit the water um, and I told my friend who's a DJ who's been a DJ in St. Louis for a long time and he was like oh god I remember that radio station and it gets this gets back to this there's something cosmic about pursuing this stuff like the TV guide things work out I came to the studio one day and there was a package and it said, Love Rich. You know, I'm like, what? And Rich was, is the DJ that works. And I opened it up and it's the day. The playlist of what they played with the commercials in it. He went back and found it, put it together, spent like forever putting this thing back together. 
and all these people calling, KHTR is my hit radio. And, it, you know, and it was like, KHTR, FM 103, St. Louis. And it's all, and then Def Leppard's photograph plays, you know. I was like, you know, and I, I'm sitting there in the studio twitching, you know, going back. <laughs> so I had that, like, playing almost every day in the studio, carving, you know, and just, oh, God, Stephanie. <laughs> then, and this is the end, um, so I'm preparing this print. Like I said, I spent six months on it, I'm carving it right now. And I was planning it, drawing. I was finishing up Brandy Baghead. And I, all the girls, I have two daughters and my wife, they were all upstairs asleep. I'm checking my email. And I'm on, I was on the MySpace page. And I get a lot of porn on MySpace. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And I don't open it, you know, I'll usually delete it or whatever, because it's junk. And there was one from this woman named Stevie B. And for some reason, I didn't delete it. And I went and checked my other email, and I came back to it, and I clicked on it. It's about 1 in the morning now, and this is while I'm planning this out. And she goes, hi, Tommy. You, you don't remember me, but my name's Stephanie Harrelson. And, my, and I think it's so great, your art is great, and how well you're doing. And at this point, I'm like looking upstairs, you know. <laughs> and I was like, you don't remember me. And I was like, oh, back to the twitching. And, <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, you know. And so I thought, okay, nine times out of ten, I'm the sniper in the trees, you know. I'm taking aim at my subjects, and I very rarely talk to my subjects. And so I was like, you know what? Oh, she said something like, I'm in California now. I'm trying to break into the industry. I don't know what that means. I do know what it means, but use your imagination. And, <laughs> and, and, she, uh, and I was like, God, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to tell her everything. I was like, hi, oh, Stephanie. You, I, I got to confess to you, I'm doing a piece about you right now. That day uh, in, J in June uh, 1983, <laughs> Keep on Loving You by Ario Speedwagon was playing. <laughs> and, and I'm doing this whole piece about you, and I'm doing it. It's going to take two years. It was amazing, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking upstairs. My wife's asleep. You know, I'm feeling like I'm getting away with something, right? And so it was almost like instant messaging. She came, she sent this message back, and, and she goes, that's awesome. My tits are going to be in a museum someday. <laughs> At that point, I fell out of the chair, and I was just like, <laughs> my wife has that look. What's wrong with you? The next day, I'm like, no, 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 no. You know. So that's it. Thanks. <laughs> I will take questions now. They better be good, too. Also, um, because the work that you may have all seen is either online, in a book, or the older stuff that's hanging up up there, I brought the newer stuff. And I'm going to lay out the real prints here in just a, a little bit. So you all can feel free to come down and look at them. Um, questions. You can ask me absolutely anything and don't be afraid. Yeah. The best career move? I'm usually asked the, what's the worst <laughs> career move. The best career move? Um, when I got out of graduate school, I, did, I, stayed, I didn't show any work to anybody for about three and a half years. I did that set called Two Weeks in August. And for whatever reason, the way that I got my start, I was living in Potosi, Missouri, back in with my parents. That is as far away from the Whitney Museum of American Art as you can get. Okay? I just decided that I would never do this again. Um, now, well, I would do it if I was 25 again, but like being 37, I just decided to get the work and put it in my car 
and drive around to the top print curators in the country and cold call them. No appointment. And just show up. At this one museum, I, I showed up and they were like, I drove like 18 hours someplace and I sort of walked in with this giant box of black prints. I was like, <laughs> I had like eight Twinkies on the way out there. I was driving this horrible car, you know, and 10 bucks, 20 bucks. Spend it all on gas, not knowing how I get back. And I just walked in and I was like, is Marjorie Cohn here? Who's the curator? Marjorie Cohn's the curator at the Fogg Museum. And I went to the Harvard. And uh, it's like one of the top print collections in the world. And <laughs> this is the first place I ever show anything. And I go in and I just sit and the secretary's like, do you have an appointment? I'm like, no, I'm Tom Huck. I do wig cuts. I love doer. You know, I'm tired and <laughs> crashing from the sugar. And, and she's like, she's in a meeting all day. It's like 9 in the morning because I drove all night. And I was like, I'm Tom Huck. I'll wait. <laughs> you know. And she came out about 4.30 in the afternoon and couldn't believe I was still there. And she was like, can I help you? I'm like, I'm Tom Huck. I do woodcuts. I want to show you my work. I love doer and all this stuff. So at that one moment, at that one moment, there's, there comes a time where somebody, I was telling you this today, somebody out there has their life, your life and your future in their hands with a decision. And she looked at me and she was like, okay. I was like, oh, I got my shot. And basically this is like, Mr. Steinbrenner, I can hit a fastball. <laughs> Just showing up. And so she takes me in the back, and I lay out all the prints. And, um, and she was like, I took her through all the stories that I told you guys tonight. And I don't really remember a lot of it, but this is my shot, right? And she looked, and she's like, how much for the whole set? And I was like, I, I didn't know what she meant. And so... I well, what do you want? What? And she was like, how much for the whole set? And I had never priced anything. And so I'm like about to do a deal with a museum here, you know. Usually this is worked out by other people. And, and she was like, for us, for the museum. I was like, oh. And I paid this insanely low price. And she wrote me a check. They had discretionary funds there at that time. That's gone the way. <laughs> That's gone now. She had whatever, you know, she decided to buy, you know, she put her, she could put her stamp on a collection without having to go through all the boards and everything. And she bought the whole set of two weeks in August. So, you know, that was my first sale. I'd done it at the top. I was 24, 25, and I thought, this is easy, man. <laughs> and I, I had like two boxes and she was like, she, I was like, bye, thanks, you know. And and she was like, wait, 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 wait. Where are you going now, next? I go, I'm going to New York. You know, I'm going to the New York Public Library. I'm going to show my stuff up there. And she was like, oh, you know, good luck. You know? And what I didn't know is all those people know each other. At that level, they all know each other. And I didn't have as much problem. I drove to New York, drove to Manhattan, never been there before, parked, got out, walked in. No, I didn't have as much problem. And I sold that set, too. Same trip. And I came back, I had some more money. I still, that's a lot of money to me now. And, and it's like, I just, I, I, in Har at Harvard, I took the check and I cashed it at the bank that it was drawn on in Cambridge or wherever it is. Just went and cashed it and had all this money because I had like $15, you know. You know, that's the best thing I ever did was going myself because I tell my students, the curators are not going to come to your door. You know, well, print curators, I could exploit them. Because I knew a lot about it. I know my print history. I know my print scene. I know that, the way that those things work. I read a lot about it. And print people are ignored in museums. They're like the ones that hide away. Nobody comes and sees my collection. You know? And so I'm this like, ah, I got it shows up on their doorstep. And they, they were like, what? You know? So I guess that, and the timing was just right. And that's how I got my start. Best career move I ever made. Going myself. Another question. Come on. Come on. Yeah, see, there's always one. Yeah. Um, I would expect you to attract a certain kind of student. You know, 
Yeah. <laughs> I do. I've never, <laughs> never heard it phrased that way. <laughs> and I scare a certain kind of faculty. <laughs> uh, although that's changing a little bit now I'm getting a little older now and when I was like 26 and teaching it was like oh man it was some the students that I get are typically the comic book kids that don't get any respect in the larger scheme of an art school and what's funny is seeing that change now because of the Chris Wares of the world and the R. Crumbs who have been sort of held up now as like art world stars. It's really changed in the last 10 to 15 years. Art Spiegelman and artists like that have made it easier for the comic book geek kids to, it's anything goes now. I do get a certain kind of student, but I also get like other ones that I feel need to be converted. <laughs> I, it, I teach at Wash U in St. Louis, Washington University, and it's a mix, it's a mix, but I do get I do get a certain ilk. I'm a great recruiter. <laughs> great recruiter. Hey, you want to come to Evil Prince and make no money and do horrible things? <laughs> You'll learn a lot, you know. <laughs> and if you're over 21, we're sponsored by PBR. <laughs> I just did this huge thing for PBR, and they, like, this is a lesson to the kids, right? I did the, they asked me to do this illustration gig on bottles and stuff for the Missouri thing. And I did it, and they couldn't pay me. It was like what they agreed. They ran out of money on the printing, and it's typical. And so I'm ha at this me, I'm like, you fuckers can't pay me? Ah, uh, you know? I was so mad, and the guy's like, wait, 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 wait. Maybe there's something we could do. <laughs> And I was like, what? And I was with my master printer, too, and he, was, he knew right away. He's like, what do you want? And Love goes, what if we get, can we get free beer? <laughs> and he's like, this guy's like, how much do you want? And I go, I don't know, what are you going to give us? And so what it is, is for two years, get your mind around this, for two years, we get 18 cases of PBR a month. <laughs> on the 6th of every month we go out to the summit distributing they bring it on a forklift <laughs> and it's that's my pay for doing this thing and I don't drink beer man my all everybody that works for me drinks beer I, I will drink it occasionally now I'm more of a whiskey guy but but yeah this is the barter man barter you should see the amount of PBR we have in our shop, right? It's insane. You just can't drink. You know, like, here, you want a case? Here, take it. I'll take one more. Make it a good one. Come on. Somebody's got to have something lurking inside there. No one? Oh, man. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Um, yeah. You know what? I, I, it, the, my best Sarah Palin moment came from vicariously through one of my graduate students at WashU, who's from Alaska. She, her friends were all in there, in with her in her studio when she was listening to it on the radio, and it was a secret who McCain was gonna have, and. It's one of those moments where Kelda, was her name, was drinking like a Coke, and I was like, and it's Sarah Palin, and she's from Alaska, and Kelda was like, <laughs> you know. I just, you know, like I said, Democrats can really suck too, but man. <laughs> Tina Fey. Tina Fey. Um, Tina Fey was something else. I, I, my take on her is that she's the bottom of the barrel. And, you know, if I do something about her, it'll be real good. I gotta let that one brew for a while. You know, because she's just so, com it's so it's comical. I saw her last night at the hotel here in town. I was like, this just can't get any more surreal because it's, you know, she's now on this book tour. I mean, I'm a news junkie, 
so I follow every move of this wo woman. And I just, it fascinates me. Oh, yeah, I'm all about it. I thought about that this morning. Yeah. Well, it's... <laughs> Well, that's the whole thing, just watching these people do this stuff. It, it's a joke in that how if you're me and you've got this background and love for print history and knowing what all my heroes did like Hogarth and Dewar and Cruikshank and, and Daumier and Goyen, all those guys, it's so easy now because it's a 24-hour news cycle. And you're going to see the same report. 20 times in a day, I'm not going to miss it, you know? Sarah Palin, that's a good one, man. But see, I'm trying to behave here because I'm trying not to say horrible things. You know? <laughs> horrible, horrible things. You can use your imagination where I'm going to go with that. But Any more? That was a good one to end on. Any more? All right, thanks for coming. <laughs>